Hello. Hello and welcome to this week's uh, Truth Proof live stream. It's uh, Thursday again and uh, we've got a great guest on tonight. Uh, as you see from the title card, we have Chris Meek, who is based up there in Scotland. Now, I'll just introduce... Uh, now, what introduce? What I will do, I'll welcome everybody who's into the chat, who I can see. And uh, let's have a look. We've got Ralph Winter in, in the stream tonight. Uh, Blue Shift, Steve Lewis and MKM Exploration and Paranormal. And don't forget our host tonight is Deborah Sing uh, host. Our moderate our moderator tonight is Deborah Singleton, who does a fantastic job week in, week out. And uh, so welcome Debbie and welcome to uh, all the aforementioned onto tonight's stream. So without further ado, we'll hit the road running. Let's go. Well, there we go. Uh, this is this week's uh, live stream from Truth Proof. My name's Les, as you, a lot of you already know, and I've got to welcome everybody from the UK and around the world. Without further ado, and without too much uh, chatter from me, we will bring Paul and his guest on. Welcome, guys. Thank you very much, Les. And as usual, it's great to be here. Another Thursday's upon us, far too quick. And tonight we're talking to Chris Meek of Scottish Paranormal Podcast. And uh, Chris, welcome and thank you very much for uh, agreeing to talk with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. Hi, Paul. Hi, Les. Hi, everybody in the chat as well. And Deborah on the moderating. Yeah, well, we, we, we kind of we spoke before. I've spoke on your podcast and I know you've got quite a lot to tell us tonight that I'm sure our listeners will be absolutely riveted to. Uh do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself first, Chris, before we get into any of your own experiences or accounts that you're going to tell us? Yeah, so I'm pretty new to the podcast game. Um, had a bit of interest in the UFO field over the years, um, mainly reading books, watching other shows out there, same as everybody else has watched over the over the years, the Strange But True, the Arthur C. Clarke, the big blue binded unexplained books used to get, used to collect all that kind of stuff. So. All the kind of things, it, never really outwardly. I mean, just always kind of research and, and, and reading stuff and, and things like that. And that's kind of as far as it went. Um, I started the podcast probably just at the start of COVID there. It's still early stages. Um, but it's kind of, the reason I kind of started this because I know um, from my own experience, we had a few stories within the family and I knew some friends with stories. Um, so I knew there's a banky people out there that's got stories within the area and out with that. So I really want to try and tap into them and, and try and collect as many as I can. And I think I mainly took a bit of a few leaves at your book as well, we, we looking at you were doing a new area and stuff as well. And I was looking at your area and, and watching all the kind of podcasts you were doing and watching all your kind of videos you had on and you're sitting on it here, basically. I mean, there's quite a lot of stuff happens in about here. And then tapping into some of the older stories, which we'll kind of talk about, it's, it's amazing what you find. Do you, do you find, Chris, I mean, it, it were for me up until 2011, that work, family, get, probably find even more time at a later stage in your life to, to devote more attention to it. But and that sometimes that's a bit frustrating that you can't pour as much time into it as you'd like at the moment, maybe. No, totally. I, that, that is it. It's uh, I'm still sitting on a few I need to edit and what people still to see and it's uh, juggling kids, a new dog <laughs> and uh, the job and all that kind of stuff and a bit of travel with the job is, is pretty hard to um, do it. I, I don't know do a lot of investigating and stuff like that. It's mainly um, podcasting and going collect the stories. But if a, if a bit does kind of follow on for that, I'll, you'll kind of trail up as much as you can. I mean, if yeah. I can do a few bits more. Um, it's it's, it's in, Chris, isn't it? You know, like you've just said, be between family life and earning a living, and I can quite understand that. Mm -hmm. So, do, do you want to 
tell us how you got involved in it because the interest won't have just come through opening a book up. I'm sure there'll have, there'll have been a, something that's kicked all this off. Is it what it from an early age? Yeah, well, one of the main things was I had a there was one story, one family story, um, which was it's one of the maddest and craziest stories that I had heard before. Um, there's a lot of kind of stories out there, UFO stories and stuff like that. But I mean, but one of the ones that stuck in my head the most, uh, which I'll get to in a wee minute, uh, was a house where I used to stay in when I was younger. Um, before that, when I was about um, probably four-ish age, maybe slightly younger than that, um, I used to see somebody. And I can't remember these stories. It was getting relayed to me with my parents or my sisters years later. But I used to see like a tall man who was in my room. And it was a, a man with a suit. I'm not saying it was an MIB or in like that. I'm just saying it was, a, it was a, I described it as a kid, as a man in a suit with a bonnet, right? And a bonnet being a hat, right? And and, and kind of Scots um, terminology. Um, so I used to see it all the time to the point that it totally freaked my mum out. Because I used to say when she was there, I used to see this person when she was there in the room. And I used to say he was in my room and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of where it stemmed for me. I couldn't remember that, but that's no thing that I could personally remember. But the things I can remember is when we moved to another house, um, I stay basically in the central belt of Scotland. So I'm kind of slap bang in the middle between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, I, stay in a, I stayed at the time in a small mining town um, called Armadale. So there, um, the house we stayed there, it was a normal kind of 40s, 50s, um, semi-detached house. You know what I mean, ex kind of council house, and um, there was a lot of kind of strange stuff that happened in the house. And I mean, but which you always tend to get where you, you see these stories where they've got like um, a lot of young kids in the house and they're kind of grown at different ages, and things do go bump in the night. You hear a lot of stories like that, the same kind of thing. So it, it happened where I stayed, and this happens right across the board with a lot of people, and they just park these wee things at the back of their mind. Yeah. So one of the main stories I can remember. Um, in the house, which I will get to. Um, so that was one that stuck in my, my mind. But when I started the podcast, uh, I contacted my sisters and, and stuff like that, and I was getting more of the stories of the house and, and other things that was relayed. So I can remember personally where there was always um, a strange feeling about the house. I was always really scared of the dark in the house and like sleeping in my bed at night and all that kind of stuff. And I'd always try and go and sleep in my mum's room and, and things like that because I, was, I had a really, really bad fear of the dark. Eh? I don't know what it was. It was just an ominous feeling about the house. And um, you had neighbours and all that kind of stuff next to you. It was as if we were in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it was it was quite localised, just at the edge of the town. So we used to have the, the, the cats and dogs and stuff like that. We'd always see something, the hackles up, they would be hissing, and they would see something in the house. And they would be following something in the house that we couldn't see. And that would happen time to time, quite a lot. Um, we'd also have um, like something outside. It was like a prowler outside. My dad, put you in the picture, my dad was a, a long distance lorry driver. So he was away from like Monday to Friday, basically. Um, and I had three older sisters. I was the youngest and my mum was there. So we stayed in this kind of um, three bedroom house, four bedroom house uh, there. So the we used to think we had a prowler, right? And at the back of the house, we had large fence, about an eight foot hedge, right? quite a big gate and about a 45 foot fence on the other side. And it kind of went up into a, a kind of slight triangle for the fact that all the houses are in a, a kind of a circular yeah. stroke kind of um, area. So that's kind of what it was. So your, every garden was kind of going at that kind of angle. So you really couldn't get out of that garden without clambering over a large fence, hedge, or tree, or, or, or something like that. So it came to the point where a few times the door handle was tried and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and that happened quite a lot. It was like, we kind of thought we had a prowler. So my mum phoned the police a few times. So we got to the point where you got quite brazen with it. You would hear the handle going because it was, it's not as if a handle would go on its own because it was had a heavy spring in it. Because you could hear yeah. the, you being a joiner, you'd probably, you, you, that noise where they kind of eee, yeah. the noise when you hear the spring going. So you know it's like, it's like a right, right strong kind of handle. You would hear that going first before the handle would get turned. Yeah. So we got to the point where being quite brave with it. And you would, the dog would be at the door as well, hearing this, or, or like with the hackles up and try to get out. So you 
grabbed the door and there was nobody there. So that happened on quite a lot of occasions. What, you, did you put it down to poltergeist type activity? I don't know. Like, I think at the time we probably chalked up. Well, we actually at the time we chalked up their travel. We thought it was maybe somebody prowling around because like young girls in the house and and whatever. I mean, that's kind of what we thought it was. And my mum did phone the police on a few occasions, and, and they came up and never found anybody or whatever else. But um, we did come to the crunch where we got a quite brazen way and opened the door, and there was no to there and and whatever else. And it wasn't just the wind making this handle do that, or there was other stuff that happened as well. I think there was other stuff we maybe seen something or whatever else, but I, I can't remember all that. But it was it, it would have been more to it just the fact that my mum kept calling the police at the time. Yeah. So. That that was that kind of thing that happened as well in the house. I could always remember that because that was with the dogs and the cats, and I could remember that, and I could always remember that kind of feeling in the house, right? And it just kind of paints a scene. So uh, how old were you then, Chris? Because uh, you, you were little we, when you described this this figure, this man in a suit. That that when I was probably it was below like five ish, four ish, right? But when we moved to this house, I was there from maybe about six upwards, roughly, yeah. um, and I stayed there till I was about twelve. In right. that property, so it was right through that kind of the time frame. So um, two seconds to get a wee drink. Yeah, no worries. So we were in in that house. So when I there was other things that happened in it as well. I can remember my friend. He'd said to me that um, I couldn't remember the story because it was when I started the podcast and I was talking about it. And he said, "No, I remember one time where there was a cabinet in the living room." The door opened the cabinet and this black thing shot past. And I said, no, I can't remember. It was no, it definitely happened. And he, and he was relating that kind of story. I said, no, I can't remember it, but it's interesting. And I was asking my sister about the house and stuff. So she told me a few stories of things that happened to herself and my mum. And um, so one of the stories was um, my sister came home at the time. She must have only maybe been, I think she was 15 at the time, she says. She came home for the academy. Okay, we used to stay not too far a walk from the, the high school. So my mum at the time was a dinner lady in the high school. So I think either uh, my sister had nipped away home early, dog in school or whatever, I'm not really sure, but there was nobody else in the house. It was just um, her herself. So she came in and she was either um, getting a glass of water at the at the sink or something, and somebody grabbed her for the, for the, the back on the shoulder. And she turned round thinking it was mother sister, like sneaking up on her. And she was going to say like F off or, or something like that there in that regard. And uh, there was nobody there. And it was a definite grab on her shoulder and there, was, and there was nobody there. So she got that much afraid. She went out of the house and she sat on the doorstep um, until my mum came home. And my mum came home and said like, what's happened to you? What, what's going on? And she says, well, told her the story of what happened. And my mum said, well, that's happened to me as well in the house a good number of times. but." I've no what to tell you for the fact that it would frighten you or you'd think it was mad. So my mum got grabbed a few times in the house as well, and but never relayed it. So that was kind of the stories. And there was another one as well where my sister said that she was in, if you imagine the downstairs, you had the kitchen, you had the living room next door, and you had the hallway kind of coming through. And next door to the living room as well, there was a, it was a dining room. You have a dining room or a bedroom, a downstairs bedroom. And my sister had it as a downstairs bedroom. And she heard my mum um, make a kind of screaming noise or, or, or a kind of like get a fright, like oh, or something like that. And she'd went through the living room and, and what had happened in the living room, my mum was in the living room and she said a, a black thing, whatever it was, came out the floor and then disappeared into the wall next door. What, what, what the shape of what did they say? She didn't, des didn't describe a shape. She just said it was a black mass, and it just and it came through the floor and then disappeared into the wall next door. Did it's not like the next door neighbour. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a semi-detached semi house. Chris. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think this is a locational thing, or do you think that somebody's done something in the house previously? You know, practice. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll get, I will get to that. I mean, because it was, it was interested in that as well. So that was one of the stories with that, right? Then my sister, uh, when she was a bit older as well, right? She's a bit older and she had a boyfriend staying over. And he woke up. There was the downstairs room again. He woke up and he, he, this was a dream, remember, right? He said he woke her up. Right? He said he had a dream that he'd seen this like troll like creature standing in it was an open you know how you get like the um old open, 
um, kind of built-in wardrobes where it's like a set of wooden doors and it's like kind of goes in maybe about 400 millimetres or something like that. It's just kind of built into the side of a cupboard. So it was one of the kind of built-in wardrobes. The doors were open and he said he, he was dreaming. This was a dream, but he said he's sure that he's seen this ugly, he, he described it as a troll-like creature, right? Standing in this doorway and then it, it transformed into a man and then it, it disappeared, right? It disappeared. It, it, it transformed it, into a... A man. He said it was like, he, he described it, it was like a, the way he described it, I don't know if really in this because it sounds a bit mad, but he said, I think at the time, he described it as a, a troll type thing and it, it turned into like a, a man, like wizard type thing, right? And then disappeared. That's why he described it as, right? Really? He said, but this, this was a dream though, right? This was a dream. Okay. But it was prominent enough that he, he related it to it and said it was a dream, but it was crazy. I'm sure it happened. It was, that's kind of what he kind of thought and it totally freaked him out, right? And this was the room next door. To the living room so that was that story um the other one but i don't want to cut well, i'm sort of just when you go just cut away it's fine. did your neighbor did your neighbors report and you know talk about anything happening just no at the, no at the time no. after a podcast did i contacted him and asked them yeah and and I, and and I said, just before we get back to chris can i just ask anybody listening or, or watching uh, us tonight. If you've got any questions for Chris, please put them in capitals, and and Deborah will make sure that Les gets them, and we shall uh, we shall move forward. Sorry for interrupting you, Chris. No, no, not at all. Um, so I did ask him after the podcast, and then I was doing a bit, and I was relaying some of these stories elsewhere. Um, I contacted him. He was the same age as me, and he had older sisters and brothers and stuff as well next door. So I asked him, and I said to him, look. The weird, some kind of weird stuff happened in my house, and there's another the weirder story which I'll get to in a wee minute, right? But I was asking about some of the, um, just the stories and stuff, and I said, did ever anything happen in your house? So he's he went and asked his sisters and stuff. So he, he showed me the text back off them, and, and they said no, nothing at all in that house. But in the last house they were in, there was a they said they'd seen a black thing standing at the bottom of their bed, and there was some other incident in another house as well. But I'm just thinking, it's it's mad. Do these things start happening just everywhere? And, and people just park it at the back of their brain. And, it's and, strange, isn't it, how we, how we shelve totally. these things away? Oh, you know, totally. You're talking about this kind of shadow, this figure that come out at floor. Mm -hmm. And I think I said on a podcast a few weeks ago, Bob Brown in, in on upper floor on top flat, he, he said there's a black shadow type thing just literally comes from outside and goes through the room, mm -hmm. which is nuts. Because, yeah, obviously... It's almost like, well, it's 30 foot up. Mm -hmm. it, it appears to be coming from outside and going through the room. And you've got some coming up from ground. And then you've got the description of this troll like thing. Obviously, you said that was a dream. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, everything sounds bizarre, but the amount of people that I speak to and you speak to and my own experiences, I think anything's plausible as well. It's, it's just crazy. And uh, that's why we're here listening to these stories. De definitely, and it, it's it's mad to when you you start talking to people, and, and people you even get people who would mock the subject, but you know yourself turn and say, "Aye, but this happened to me." <laughs> yeah, you get that quite a lot, and but um, a lot of people do park at the back of the brain. But the story I'll tell you next was the story that I remembered most about the house, and from telling the story in a podcast, and then I done another, I done another story about another thing which I will talk about in a wee bit. And it brought somebody else to me who had a bit more knowledge of the story of my mum and dad. So my mum and dad, so so the, the story I knew mainly, this is the main story. And before I left the house, I was at the time I must have been about 12. And my mum and dad were just about to split up or they were arguing anyway that night, right? And they were in the they were in the, I was outside, there was nobody else in the house apart from they two. And my sisters were slightly older at that point, so they'd be away gallivanting somewhere. And I'd be out playing. It was I knew at the time it was in the winter time because it was I can remember when I was out, it was dark. So it'd probably be in the months say October onwards anyway, because you, you go in, it's like the it's a lot darker when you're outside um, playing and stuff like that. So I was out and I came in and I left my mum and dad who were having a, a bit of an argument. And I went out to kind of forget it, to play with my friends and stuff. Came back in and they were looking for something in the living room. So they were like kind of perplexed, looking for something. I, I just kind of got ushered away to my room. And the, what has transpired was they were in the living room and middle of a, a right heated argument. 
and the living room door burst open. So the living room door, if you can imagine, it, it, it was a quite a heavy living room door, thick carpet behind it. You wouldn't you didn't push this open easy, right? It was one of the what I could describe the actual. You've been a joiner, you remember this. See, see where you get the, the spring loaded balls. Yeah. It's not like a, a latch. It just basically it's a ball ball catch, yeah. so you can push the door open, but the so it's like a kind of ball catch in it. So so you could push it open, but it was a heavy door to push. Plus it had a thick carpet behind it, so it was like a. A, you could hear the sweeping motion of the carpet when you pushed it over. I can always remember that. So, and that makes it the thing that, so the door burst open and this black thing came in the living room and like a, a black ball and a black mass and it, it went in, it went round my dad's legs and it, and it shot across the living room and it disappeared round about the couch area or behind the couch and they didn't know what it was. And all my dad said was, my mum re relayed this to me because she relayed the story and said, it totally freaked him out. My dad was a, my dad was a total skeptic um, about anything like that. And um, it ended up, he, he'd said, it, it never had a head. It never had a head. That was that was all he kept saying. We had a black dog that was locked in the kitchen, right? And we had like a cat and the cat was outside and all that kind of stuff. But this thing came in and it, it disappeared when I was at the couch area. And they were looking for it. Um, so for you and, to say it never had a head, mm -hmm. was it just a moving mass or did it have legs, arms? I, I didn't get this. The thing is, I didn't get the, to me, the story that, that I heard, it was just like a black ball or a black mass that came out solid. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like, like smoke and all that. It was basically like a solid thing that came in and went round his legs and then it went over to the couch and disappeared. So the funny, the funny thing is, so that was the story, the black thing, right? And and no long after that, they split up, they moved, well, I moved to a separate town, and my dad kind of went off and moved and, and all that. And I couldn't get, like, the, the thing is, I podcast about it recently, and one of the questions was, it'd be good to get a better description. And I said, that would be good. I said, but my, my dad just, I was kind of strange from my dad for a while, and I hadn't spoke to him for something like 18 years. And I recently um, spoke to him again. Um, I think it was just before COVID. It was it was probably it was about three or four months before COVID, and he died at the start of COVID. So I didn't really, I, I wouldn't have probably. It's not the kind of thing I probably would have brought up anyway. We hadn't seen yeah. each other in eighteen years or whatever else. But I couldn't even ask him though anyway. Mom died when I was um, twenty one, so I couldn't ask her either. So, but the interesting thing is, I, I podcasted a story, um, which I'll get to. Yep. And, and it's a story that's been covered before, but the reason I, I wanted to cover it is because I knew the person, he stayed in the corner for me. So that's why I covered the story and I wanted it basically, because I kind of didn't think it got enough kind of limelight apart from other cases in the area. So I wanted to kind of highlight it a wee bit and talk about it. So when I spoke to him, um, he had relayed a few um, other kind of things, which I'll get to when I tell the story. And from that, from that, somebody else contacted me with um, a few stories, a uh, scene, lights and stuff like that, okay? So I'll, I'll tell a wee bit of the story. So at the end of the podcast, when I, when I spoke to him and his story, right about the, about the Black Triangle, okay, which I won't get to, he relayed another story about seeing some lights in the skies, like like large orbs and stuff like that. And it was quite recent, um, coming from the same vicinity to where he's seen this Black Triangle back in 94. Right. And, so I relayed that in the podcast and somebody contacted me and said, I've seen something like that as well, quite recently, in the past like six months or four months maybe even. Same location. It was same location, but they didn't know it was, because I knew where the guy stays now, and they didn't know, they seen it out their back window, same location above where he'd seen it, right? Not and sure. what they'd seen was, um, if I can remember the story, right, I've started to go and see them. Um, but the story was it was either like a, an orange or gold colored, colored orb in the sky moving at right angles erratically um, in the sky. And it, they watched it for a wee bit. And I think the words were um, her and her husband watched it. She was doing dishes at, at the back. And it's, if you can imagine her, where her house was situated, it was it was um, it looked out to moss land. And then you got moss land so far, and then there was some kind of farmhouses, and there was more of the town on the left-hand side. So above there, there's a flight path there. You, you, get, you get planes and stuff like that coming over, and you know what planes are, you know what they look like. Um, but you said this thing was flying erratically, it doing totally quite fast right-angle turns and staying in the kind of same area, and then it, it shot off and, and disappeared. 
and her and her husband watched it. So I got a bit of that story off her, and it was just through Facebook messaging and, and stuff like that. And I remember that I, I knew that I knew the lady, and uh, I knew her quite well. And it was a woman's best friend, because she stayed across the road from me. Ah, it ties in, yeah, got it. So I, I went back to her and I said, "Did you do you know the story?" the black the black thing the woman will tell you the story and she says oh i know totally all about it so i've not went to see her yet but she, she's told me this is just basically a long piece of chat so basically and i'm not going to go into extreme details because i can't do the fact that i've not got it for the fact that um i still want to talk about it to her and stuff like that but what she'd said was and i heard a wee bit of the story from my sisters as well where my mum and and this lady went to see psychics right one weekend and this, chris is this before the black thing yes right yes. but it relates in here that's what i'm thinking yeah all right so they went to see psychics and my mom never got taken to see the psychic because they were, i think they were too busy or whatever there was like too many people so my mom basically um had said to them to book them back in to come at the house and they're reading at the house and they're going to invite some friends over and, and all that kind of stuff and so that was kind of organised. The the psychic came at the house. What I can remember is she was from a place called Helensboro, which is like far um, west of Glasgow. And she said that the lady came to the house and straight away, before she got in the house, she said she had a bad feeling about the house um, because it had at the front of the door, it had two really, really, really large rowan trees and a rowan tree at the back and a triangle. And that in days gone by in Celtic mythology, that's to, to ward off evil and, and things like that. So people put them there for a reason to try and ward off evil and things. Um, rowan so rowan trees. trees. Did you say rowan trees? Rowan tree, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So apologise to, apologize to anybody who can't understand me. I will try and speak a bit slow. It's all good. Um, not as broad Scots. Um, so there was two really, really big rowan trees at the front of the house. And one at the back in a triangle so it was right at the back garden so and it ran through that room when they'd done the reading and they relayed the when, when the women came into the room because in the room next door to love them used to be my sister's bedroom she had moved out at this point and it was um a dining room so they were in there and she she asked has anything happened in this room and they relayed the story about the boy having the dream the guy having the dream about seeing the thing and and, he, and she said no that wasn't a dream so the readings kind of went on. They got to my mum and the psychic had basically told my mum that my dad was having an affair, right? So he was having an affair when he was waiting and described it quite a lot. My mum had a, a kind of idea, but she confirmed it with some things that she said and, and totally, I, I don't know the inner workings what she told her, but it was, my mum was convinced definitely 100% that it was kind of thing for what she had relayed, described a lot of stuff, described the person and described, um, he's trucking all that kind of stuff and, and things like that. So that was like maybe earlier on in the week. They got to the weekend. Uh, that weekend was the weekend when my mum confronted my dad, and that was the argument, and that's when the black thing appeared. Yeah, right, right. But she said that there was more to it. There was more to it. She said she said in the story that the the thing, the story I can remember the thing coming in. She came in the room. But it went on the couch and it, started, it was on the couch and was moving about in the couch that much that they couldn't discern what it was. And then it disappeared. And then she said as well, later on in the room, there was a, a funny spell in the next door room and they seen some type of creature in the corner. That's what they said. I've not got a description of that, um, but that's, I've still to go and meet her and talk to her and got all this um, and recorded and stuff like that. But totally mad story, uh, absolutely. And I knew, see the thing is like for me, because that happened to my mum and dad, and it's I know one hundred and fifty percent it happened. It's yeah. no as if it's like you you've maybe got that tiny wee bit of percentage. Maybe it could have been this, or you've seen this, or you've seen that. My mum and dad were quite plausible people. They weren't mega airy fairy or anything like that. And it was like my dad was a total skeptic. He was in the army and stuff like that. And he didn't. Um, and then he was like a lorry driver for years. You know what I mean? So he didn't believe in any of that at all. And it totally freaked him out. And I can mean that the story was after it, he'd, he'd call my mum a witch because she thought she'd, he'd caused this thing. <laughs> and, he'd met, he'd met, and he'd met to the affair and all that kind of stuff. And then soon after <laughs> that, we split up and we moved away. And and that was it. And it was, the funny thing is, though, 
Right, my mum moved away, never took him, uh, never took any off him, just we, we moved and split him and stuff like that. And that point in history changed my life to a certain point because uh, this thing, and not just that thing, but the whole kind of thing together. Fine. And it's, I and it's just absolute mad. I mean, it's like a, a crazy, it was a, a crazy story. And actually, for now, they've, they've cut the they've cut the trees down now. Um, and it's really, really bad luck to cut these trees down because in the mythology, it's when I was looking online about some of the different descriptions here and some Celtic mythology, uh, um, it wards against evil and changelings. That's right. what it says. So the ruin, this is the Rowan tree. The Rowan tree, yeah. yeah. But it's strange how it affected your dad, you know, as a total skeptic. You know, it, 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 it's. It didn't change him though, did it? And make him a believer. You've you, you've known no. he, he actu actu actually started pursuing the unexplained and trying to find out more no. more answers. No, no, not at all. No, no, I know it. Um, I, I, I know it, think it, it, you're not going to find out now. <laughs> yeah, I think it scared them more than anything else. Yeah, um, I think it freaked them totally out. But, you know, it. tonight, uh, Chris, or well, not long before. Uh, I spoke to you uh, early doors, uh, talking to a, a scientist who I've written about in next book. Uh, we'll just use his first name of Pat. And it, it relates to the Willsthorpe incident. And that has totally changed his view on everything. Mm -hmm. I don't mean he's, he's changed professions. He's still, he's still doing the same job, the same sort of scientific research and what have you. But he lives in York. And he's, I, had to, I contacted him because I wanted a sketch of what he saw in September 2009. So once again, we're jumping back to Willsthorpe. You'll have heard me talking about Willsthorpe. And we've mm -hmm. got another witness. And not only he can date it, seeing this object of September the 15th. So it actually hits the nail on the head for Willsthorpe. And, but he's seen something 150 foot above his head. Like a, he said, like a slice of cheesecake flying mm -hmm. over the top of him. Uh, 150 foot above his head, like rolled steel as big as a 737. And this guy looks for answers and the the logical in everything. And I said to him, like, because it's 2009, so it kind of relates how it affects different people. I said, you know, do you, do you think about it often? He says, every day. Hmm. I, I just can't get it out of my mind. I can't think of an answer for what it could have been. And he said it, were, it, was, it was as though it were absorbing the air and the silence as it were travelling. You know, it's a crazy thing. But that hmm. sent him in another direction. Whereas what's happened with your, with your dad... It, because I think you would have heard, wouldn't you, off your older sisters and everything, if yeah. you started actually pursuing answers. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it probably just made him even more clammed up and tight with things, you know? I don't it's, know. It's funny how some people react to it. To, like my, my wife, for example, um, she doesn't want you to know because then it exists. Yeah. And it's no, she doesn't believe. It's um, if she looks into it and then realises what she doesn't want to know what's out there, basically that's it, and she'd rather know, no. So what does um, she think to you, your interest then, Chris? Because it's hard not to want to know when she's uh, married to somebody who's pursuing so she, she does, she does, she does be believe, and she's got a bit of belief in stuff, but she doesn't want to know. That she, mm. And she thinks it's good I'm doing this and stuff, but she's uh, she'd rather know, no. Um, yeah. just because she doesn't want to know what's out there. She wants right. to be oblivious to it. <laughs> so yeah. It's, but yeah, it's funny, though, how you get people, like, and I was thinking that, you get people like that, where you'll get people who don't believe it and are not willing to look, and you'll get people who potentially believe it but don't want to look so don't want to know what's there because yeah. they're, too, they're too scared to know what's there and, and, and things like that. Got, then you've got your experiencer who mm -hmm. doesn't believe or won't admit what they've seen. <laughs> don't, 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 don't want to admit to seeing something or don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Prime example is the guy coming home from Sledmere with me, Shorty. Mm -hmm. I talked about it for a few days and I hadn't spoken to him for a few years, but I know when I did, didn't want to know. Don't want to talk about it. Just mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, don't get me wrong, he doesn't have to. But any road, I'm rambling and it's your show. We'll just ask Les if he's uh, got any questions. Is out there, Les? Yes, uh, we've got, uh, let's have a look, let's see if I can uh, find out uh, on my tablet who's wrote the questions. Right, so I've got a question from Justin Apple. Have, yeah, <laughs> have you researched any UFO reports based in Falkirk slash 
Bonnie Bridge. Um, I wouldn't say UFO reports, but I've um, I wouldn't say investigated either, because I wouldn't say um, but I have took accounts from um, abduction like scenarios for, from that area, which I'll probably talk about in a wee bit, but can't go into too much detail of it. Okay, so so we're going to touch on them, are we? In, in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I've got yeah, I've got another question uh, for you, guy, uh, for you, Chris. Uh, Mick Park is asking, what is what is the best U UK UFO incidents you would like to investigate? Has he got so, more questions? <laughs> it, is, it probably is, yes. Yeah. So, what is the best UK UFO incidents you would like to investigate, uh, Chris? That's a that's a good question, actually. Um, the best one. It's a hard one, like there's that, there's, there's that many good ones out there. Mm, yeah. There's that many good ones out there. Yeah. You, you've got like Rendlesham and, and, and stuff like that, but um, that's been kind of done to death. No, I wouldn't say it's totally done to death, but um, you want to know what happens in it and stuff. But I think some of these cases, I think one of the ones I'll touch on a wee bit, and I'd like to have known a lot more about that. Um, the Black Triangle incident that um, that Andrews Swan had seen in Armadale, like that, for example, because it was so close to home, and like literally close to where I stayed, it was probably a mile away. And are, are you going to talk about that now, or do you want to tell us about it in a bit? Yeah, we'll go. We'll, we'll talk about that in a wee bit. But that, I'd say probably that. I'd like to know a lot more about that. Black and, Triangle incident. I'll have to write it down in case you don't mention it again. No, I will, mate. I'll talk about it. I've got it up my yeah. list here. Yeah. Okay. Aldo Rain uh, is asking, kids seem to pick up a lot. Uh, pick. Right, I'll start that one again. Kids seem to pick up a lot of strangeness. Yet don't actually realise it's unusual until they are older. I wonder if these spirits seem to be aware of this vulner uh, vulnerability, uh, stroke, lack of fear, and target it. Do you no, I, 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 th I think that, but more. Uh, susceptible to seeing these things when we're younger, and and somewhere along the line, I don't know if I would say you could probably say like young kids get targeted more and stuff, but I don't know if it's maybe in a case that we see it more, and then maybe they see us more, and then eventually at some point we lose that. Some people don't. That's kind of like some of the theories. One of my theories in it anyway. We I think we're all tuned yeah, and then it goes. But some people keep it. A lot of people have. Have these experiences and forget about them just like you had that experience as a child your, your sisters remember it you talking about it yeah uh yeah and you, your mum clearly did but if you it's just passed you by and it but loads of people do you know and it's touched on a few of our grandchildren as well that kind of thing where they remember mm. it i've documented every little bit of it yeah but just because and I don't know. I don't know if they're going to remember it in years to come. But we'll just we'll let, let's carry on. See if he's got out else for us. Yeah. Uh, one more question uh, for this period. It's from Space Cadet Lottie, and the question is: Has Chris any local reports of wild men, historical or current? Plenty of them where he lives. I think wild men. <laughs> he, funnily enough, uh, there is a case that will touch on. Um, uh, I'll touch on it in a wee bit, but I had a, a report going back a few weeks ago, um, and this was going back to 2018, and it was a drive-by case, and, and they basically, the, the drove-by, there's wooded area, going about 40 miles an hour, and the scene, it was it was in kind of daylight, or like daylight stroke, kind of getting a bit dark, but they seen the outline, they said, the way they described it is what a Bigfoot would look like, right? And to the point where kind of rubbernecking in the car, driving, they done what they'd done, 50 minutes later they came back to check if this thing was just trees or foliage or whatever it was, and it was gone. Mm. So, and it was a, it was a that, the funny thing is, right, for me, it was a, it was a, a quick sighting, as they said, and they were, it was prominent enough for them to contact me and say, is there any other reports in the area? Because I've seen this come back then in 2018, and it wasn't the greatest sighting, but it definitely wasn't the way when I came back, and it was the only way I could describe. I couldn't see. They couldn't see face in it. They could see the outline there, and it looked like a big foot standing in this wooded area, just at the side of the road. Two people, and right or one? One person. See, there's two right. people in the car, but I think one person, the passenger, yeah. seen it. And then when they went back, it wasn't there. 
But interestingly enough, um, that was the same location as the Bob Taylor um, UFO abduction incident. And it was four miles away from the Silverman sighting as well. Interesting, isn't it? Like we're talking about multi-phenomena areas. Just yeah. while you touch on that, that sighting, it doesn't sound dissimilar to what our moderator, Deborah, saw. Because, uh, you know, she had a similar sighting, what you would call a drive-by sighting. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point, Les, we're going to have to get Deb on to talk about these things to us. But uh, any more questions, Les? Yeah, I'll uh, squeeze one more in. I think it's from Lee Roscoe. Does Chris think wild men are real or paranormal? I think they're real when they're here. If that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know where they come. I don't know where they come from, but um, I would say we look, we look into it. I, I don't predominantly look into a lot of Bigfoot or Sasquatch sightings or any wild men. Like obviously the UK wild men or Woodgoose and, and, and stuff like that. I, I, it wasn't like any my forty at all or, or looking into it, and I didn't disbelieve it. But it was a thing that I just I'd had totally no interest in it. I just didn't think there was much there to it or, or much foundation to it. But that again, but when you look at you look into this, it's unbelievable the amount of accounts out there. And it's unbelievable um what people see. But I have either we've got thousands of really good actors that lie, or we've got thousands of people who are telling the truth. You know what I mean? And I'm thinking the latter's going to be the, the most kind of logical kind of sense. Um mm -hmm. But right across the world. Yeah, yeah, they're too right. I mean, uh, I, some, I've said loads of times myself, I never really thought I'd be interested in the cryptid type mm -hmm. uh, research, but I'm hooked, absolutely hooked. And these witnesses we've got are brilliant. And uh, I'm sure that there's people listening to this and or will listen to it afterwards who've got equally good stories. And uh, if you're from our neck at Woods, please get in touch. And if you've got, to, you know, if you're up in, in Scotland, contact Chris. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. Right then, uh, shall we continue, Les? So where do you want to pick up on, Chris? Uh, do we want to talk about the three red orbs? Yeah, so that was a no. The, the red orbs or the three red orbs is that was just number three in the in the list. <laughs> so let's, let's start off. With, I'll go through kind of chronologically. So I wrote a kind of list of just some of the things that I could I was jotting down that I could remember and maybe yeah. I talked about it in previous. Uh, discussions and that with people but I had a um, we moved out of the house didn't have much experiences seeing seeing much or anything like that or experiencing anything strange in the house or whatever and when I got to um 18 I moved I, I moved back to my Armadale and then I, I moved again to a friend's house which is a few towns over and I was basically just renting a, a room in his house and it was in that house, which he kind of thought was haunted himself. Um, it, it really the story going back years ago. He said he kind of, his mum and that thought it was haunted. He stayed in the house after his mum moved out. So I kind of, I'd, I'd moved in with him uh, for a, a year or so. And it was in that house I started getting sleep paralysis. So I could remember getting sleep paralysis. And um, I was watching TV and I must have dozed off watching TV and then woke back up again. And it was the, the classic sleep paralysis signs where you, you feel a presence in the room. Um, I couldn't, I could, I could look, couldn't move. I was actually sitting upright. I was in the chair, sitting upright. I could see the TV, but I, I had the, I felt a presence from my right hand side, but I couldn't turn my head. If you feel the presence feeling, just might be the, the fact that you're, you're freaking out, you're locked in that position, um, but you do feel it all the same. So I had that then, and that was the first time I could remember it happening to me in that house. Mm -hmm. And it happened in that house quite a lot. I used to get it about every week to two weeks, quite a lot. And and, it, and I moved out of that house. Stayed through, I never really seen anything when it, when it happened, apart from one time, which I'll tell you about. Um, so out of, out of all the times, I'd be, I'd be the ones waking up, totally paralysed in my bed. You can only see one direction and you feel like a kind of presence in the room and then you eventually get back up. And some of the points where you'd actually feel like you were getting pushed back down again. And you could just, maybe you just, you're struggling that much to get up, yeah, your body's just kind of, it's your muscles or whatever else. I always just try to rationalise it. Yeah. Um, but I moved out that house to another friend's house, a few, a, back a, a couple of times over, that happened there. And the interesting thing there is, so I moved into his house and I decorated this room in his house and it'd been a plasterer, skimmed the walls and painted and, and stuff like that. 
So I was in there and I used to get it in that house as well. And he never believed me. He used to never believe me that it happened. And when I moved out of that house, it only happened one more time. And it was in the, it was from there, I was, I was moving down south to see my sister who stayed in Cornwall. And the other time it happened, this was the very last time it happened. So it happened that, that first house and that time in the next house and then one time on my sister's house, am I right? Um, before I left, they were in the Cornwall. So it was in the same town. And it was over the period, probably about a year and a half to two years where I had this. And I had it every week to two weeks. I used to get it all the time. And to the point where I used to, I used to sleep with the light on and stuff like that, even like when I was in my early 20s, because the dark used to um, freak me out for a young age. Now, now I can't sleep with a chink of light in the room. I need to kind of have everything darkened off. Um, but the interesting thing is, so the last time I had it, I was sleeping on my sister's couch and I was lying on the couch looking at the living room window. And the living room window was, um, it had, if you imagine, a set of curtains and a set of blinds behind it. So the blinds were closed, but the curtains were open roughly about 500 mil. All right, yeah. so the gap in the middle. You can see the orange glow for the streetlight shining in. So I had a side view on that when I was sleeping on the couch and looking out. I woke up and I could see the figure, a, like somebody standing in between that bit with the light shining through. And I could see it was a woman. I could see the hair. Right? So it was like, this is just totally black. Inside right? or outside? In, the inside the room. Inside the room, but standing probably like four metres away from me, three and a half metres away from me, standing where that gap was with the light shining through, with the, just a tinge of the orange light and the blinds. And then uh, it came towards me. And uh, at the end, I had sleep paralysis. I, I couldn't move. And I was looking side on. And it came towards me and it, it kneeled down in front of my face and then disappeared. And I came out of sleep paralysis. And that was the only time I've ever, ever seen anything. And I, I chalked it up in my own head to a dream. Um, but it definitely happened. I definitely seen some. <laughs> I mean, and for all the times, um, it, that was that only happened in the two properties and once there, and it stopped. Never happened anywhere else. And, and that was if, it. You'd, if you'd got a weak heart or anything, that kind of thing could uh, finish a person off, couldn't it? You oh, know? totally. All right. All right. I used to get it all the time, and it, to the point sometimes where you felt yourself getting pushed back down. And the, the funny thing was, right, and this is the, the crazy thing with the story, the friend who I shared the house with, who I decorated the room, because it was quite nicely decorated, he moved into that room and I moved out. It started happening to him. Right, all right. And and so do you think that's locational then, or do you think it's some attack? Either it was, either, it was something to do with me and thinking I was there or it was locational. I, I don't know. But yeah. he moved into that room and he, and he told me, like, either we, it was like years after when I'd moved back in to the area. And he said, remember that time you used to say about the sleep paralysis? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, when I moved, you moved out, I moved into that room and uh, it started happening to me. And he said, I never believed you. He said, but it started happening. Because it, he said at one point he felt himself getting pushed down to the back when he was lying in his bed. Um, but totally mad. Absolutely yeah. mad. Well, do you know, I'm not sure I've experienced that, but I, and, and this, I used to go and play snooker. And the guy I played snooker, we talk, he'd come up one evening, seven, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, he's talking to me. He'd had a sleeping afternoon. So it's, it's a daytime thing that happened to him. They call him Graham. He lives a few streets away. I don't say his surname, but I don't think he'd mind. So he's upstairs, laid on a sofa, and he'd got a TV in this room. It's the big old Victorian houses. You've lots of room. And can you picture a little cabin that your TV had gone, and you'd have two, two glass doors, and yeah. you'd, you know, you'd put things in it, DVDs or whatever. No glass doors on it. He said, and I woke up, and I'm television's off, and I'm looking. And there's a face looking at me from these this opening be, be, behind underneath TV. He said, and it's hideous. He said, it's an horrible place. He says, and I'm thinking all rational things I can think. Is it a reflection? I don't mean he's got an horrible place, but he says, is it a reflection I'm looking at? He says, and then I realised there's no doors on it, you know, even though it's his own piece of furniture. Hmm. So that's, uh, that's not quite sleep paralysis, but he felt like he couldn't move. Uh, but it's it, not the same kind of description, but what a weird thing for this face to be below TV in cabinet, look, kind of looking at him from under there. It's mad, Real, huh? Spooky. He said it frightened him, you know, a spooky kind of thing. But any road, let's jump back to uh, Chris and... It, 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 the sleep paralysis did frighten me, and I got used to it. 
just because it happened that that much. And I used to look into it, and I knew other people were happened to as well. And to the point where I know, like one of my friends had seen things as well. And um, to the point where it used to freak him totally out. And it, it happened to a lot of people. What do you think it is? We, we, you I, I don't know. To me, to me, to me, I, to me, I rationalised it. Yeah, it's not as simple, people, as saying, well, he's just told you it's sleep paralysis. What, what do you think's happening? Do you think it's some kind of glitch in the brain that's that's causing these sensations? Or do you think it's something external that's... I, I, think, I, do, think it's, I do think it's something external mm. that, that's doing it. I mean, I, I chalked it up to, to rationalise it. That um, At that period, I was probably partying too much and I was just, it was happening to me because of that. But I partied when I was younger, a lot longer than like a year and a half to two years. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. That's how I rationalised it, but I I don't. It's, it's hard to see what it is, but I think it's it's some it's some putting a pause on you <laughs> for for yeah. some reason or another. Yeah. Um, it definitely is. It's, it's something like that. I don't know what it is or who's doing it, but it's it's like somebody putting the pause button on you for some reason. Or what it, what it, can you remember what what kind of period it was in your life? I mean, was it a period with a lot of trauma or a lot of relation? New relationship, um, you know. I, I, probably, I don't know. Like, I, I was between the ages. Of, I was eighteen to about like um, twenty. So I don't know. The times are, I don't know. Um, I wouldn't say so. No. Trauma wise, or anything like that. Maybe, but it's. I think it's just a. It's a mad thing. I mean, for the whole thing that one at the end, seeing seeing the thing at the end, and that was the last one I had. It was definitely like it was a black. I'm not saying like a shadow into the rain. It was mainly because it was like the light was behind whatever this was, and it was just because it was the room was dark anyway. It was just totally black. But I could see hair, I could see long hair when it, it came down in, in front of my face. Just strange. I mean, just totally strange. But that again, you chalk, you, you rationalise these things, and you just chalk it up to it must have been a dream. Put it at the back of your mind, and that's oh, yeah, it. Well, it's simply because it is unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, totally. And that's it. And, I never, and things like that, I never really told anybody that for years. And and the same with the kind of family stories and stuff. I never really talked about them that much. But then when you start looking into them, you're like, that's quite a strange story. I mean, it's like a really strange story. One of the other strange stories, which and it's, which I'll get to in a wee minute, um, and I'd even forgot about it myself, which is funny. That, no, this one. But I, so I had one first where uh, I stayed in the town of Bathgate and there's like hills, hills area in Bathgate. And used to do this run run the hills and just run the roads of the hills. And it would take me it just it was maybe about five miles or so or something. So I used to run that. And, I, and there's country parks and that stuff about as well. And on the way around this this hill area, there was another wee forest bit area that I'd um, I'd never ran in before. And I seen trails in it as I was passing. And I kinda thought to myself, well, next time I come up, I'm going to run in there. And at this time, you need to remember, I wasn't outwardly looking for anything in regards to paranormal phenomena or, or anything like that. I was reading books and watching programmes and that was probably um, all I was doing. So I wasn't outwardly looking, I was out for a run. So one day I drove up to this this small forest, fielded area, trees and that, and then there's a deeper forest at the, it's not big, it's maybe about a mile square or something, and then there's wee trails and about it and stuff. And they, I ran through this smaller forest first and like farm, no farmland, like kind of um, flat land until you get to it and there's a kind of steep hill and you enter the forest. I got to the top of it and I stopped. Some Something told me, no, nothing told me, but in my head it was like, don't go any further. And it was the it was the, the total feeling that everybody talks about the, the dread and, and all that kind of stuff. It was like total dread. It was like something for me, it was malevolent there. Don't go any further. It did, was, did, did the atmosphere change? For what I can remember, yes. I mean, it was for I kind of remember. I know when you, you look at these reports and people say they can't hear anything and all that, I couldn't remember nothing like that, but I could remember the fear I had. The way I described it is like when you're younger, when you're younger and you're and you don't know anything, like maybe say below 10 and somebody says there, there's a spooky thing here and you've got that really, really creepy fear, or you go somewhere and you've got that feeling because you're probably more susceptible. With, if you that when you're younger, it was like going back to that again. It was like going back to being a child again and having that intense fear of something you didn't know. And I, I cut my run short. I stopped what I was doing. And I didn't go into the forest anymore. And I came back 
And it was the strangest thing because it was never outward looking for anything there or, or anything like that. And I don't know why. This was during the day. This was like 12 o'clock during the day. And I came back and I think I probably mentioned my wife and that was that. Forgot about it again. Right? That was the, that was the last I'd heard of that. And um, it ties in with something later on. I'll tell you though, which I found out later. Um, so that was that. I forgot about that story. And then there's another kind of story. I'm just kind of running through chronology some of the stories yeah, that yeah, happened yeah. through the time. And I forgot about this one as well. So I was running again, but this time at night. I used to run. Um, the time when I was running for the sleep paralysis, I was training for the marine reserves at the time. So I was doing a lot of training and stuff. And then years later, this was only probably about 11 years ago, I was doing uh, triathlon stuff. So I'd be uh, training at all different times. So I'd come home from work. You maybe got the, the odd um, um, homer job on. I mean, I don't know if you call, they call them in England, what they, they call down there. Is that, um, what they call you doing? A bit of work, cash in hand kind of stuff. I kind of aim, right, but home or work, or so maybe doing the odd one of them at night, or you maybe I'd still run after it, or if I was working late or whatever, I'd um, I'd still go and get my run in. So I'd run early in the morning, run at night. So the town I stayed, basically, if you can imagine, um, if you looked at the land from above, it would be fully green land, forestry, a lot of farmland, smaller kind of hills. Um, and then dotted around about the countryside, there'd be all these small mining towns like Armadale, Bathgate, and and this is right as in between Edinburgh and Glasgow, all the kind of way. So you've got all that kind of dotted about, but it looks like when you, if you came above it and looked down, it looked like a lot of greenery. But you've just got these kind of small pockets of towns all about. So to one town to the next, it's maybe like three miles between Armadale and Bathgate. So on the outside of the town, I stayed right at the the the, the skip of the town, right at the top of India. So there was a cycle path that ran from um, Armadale to Bathgate. So I, I would run that, maybe run out and run back a certain distance. I would kind of time it or I'd have like a watch it tell me or whatever. And I, I wouldn't care about running at night. I wouldn't be scared of the dark or anything like that. So I'd just be out running. So I had this this small torch and it was one of these, um, the older LED ones used to get where it's like the weekend kind of diodes. It was like white yeah. diodes and they don't cast a lot. It's nothing like you get now that would totally blind you you know what i mean like, it's just like it casts a wee bit of light in front of you so you could probably see a kind of small circle where you're running but there was probably a bit of moonlight in the night because i could remember seeing um if you looked into the field when once you kind of get out of the town right it was like off farmland and then there was um some wee bits of forestry but mostly kind of farmland yeah you see the outline of things contours yeah of so you, you look over the field you can see the field the the cycle pass a wee bit more elevated than the field, probably about probably about five to six feet or so, and elevated higher than this. It used to be a railway line. So when you look in the field, you can see um, you can see the field. You can see gorse bushes, so you can see like, the darker gorse bushes at the edge of the field, and you can see the fence posts that are like darker as well. So I was running along, and something caught my eye as soon as I came out past these trees. I could see an open field, which has usually got um, cattle in it. It's usually got cows and, and stuff like that in it. So, sun caught my eye when I was running. I looked over, and it was a, a small red dot, right? It looked like a small LED. This was this was about half nine, ten at night, right? And there's lots of trails about, and tracks about. That's a farmer's field. I mean, you wouldn't usually get a lot of people in there because it's usually it's usually like cows and cattle and stuff. But I seen a small red dot in, in the middle of this field, quite far over. And as soon as I, I seen it, it started tracking towards me, right? And the, the first thing I thought. Of, is oh no that dog's kind of coming for me and i kind of thought somebody had like a dog with an led collar or something like that that's yeah. the first initial thing i thought so this thing was it was trailing along the ground not like it was, i'd say it was probably three feet above the ground but at this point it was a good bit away from me so i could see it try to intercept me as i'm running it's running towards Is where i'm going to go yeah, as well. yeah it was it was bounding right yeah. so when i'm running along the track it's trying to intercept me so I'm kind of thinking, I hope the gate at the bottom, because once you get along this bit, it's probably the better part of like 600 to 700 metres long, right? It's a good distance um, before you got to the road, right? And the road was like higher up and it was like a, a bridge you went under. I'm just trying to describe it, put the picture in. So so this thing's coming towards me. I'm still thinking, it's a dog. I hope the gate's locked because it's going to get me at the bottom if it's not locked. So it comes in and it meets me. And it's this is only maybe five to ten meters away from me right and it's 
it's roughly about the same height as the fence, so it's about it's about three to four feet off the ground. And it's weaving it in between the gorse bushes as I'm running. How big? No, I'm, it's, it's small. It's not like an orbit. It's like a small L, red LED. That's what it looked like, a small red LED. And it was it was going in between the the gorse bushes. So the line of gorse bushes along the fence, right? So you had the fence, a, a, slight, a slight slope because the path is elevated. Then you had the fence. Then over the fence, you had a row of gorse bushes. And they were just sporadically, just maybe the, the first two metres into the field, gorse bushes. This thing was weaving in front of them and behind them, right? All the way along, following the contours of the ground. So I'm still running, still running, still thinking at the time, still thinking it's a dog and it's going to get me at the end of the field. So I run, I see, I get to the gate, the gate's, the gate's locked, right? And I turn around and I see the thing and it passes, and it passes behind the gorse bush then disappears. So I, I, I go on, under the underpass and I kind of think, that's, that was odd. I, I come back and I look into the field. I never ever heard anybody shouting on a dog, right? I was thinking, I never heard anybody shouting on a dog because I was straining to hear it at the time. So I was wanting somebody to say, right, call it back for me to get a tack rate or anything like that. So then I look around and, and it's no there, right? It went behind this course bush and disappeared it quite close to me. Couldn't see it again. Some kind of went over next to the fence. I'm looking about. Couldn't see it anywhere. Couldn't you hear nothing. Deadly silent. You would have heard if it were a dog, Chris, wouldn't you? That close. Totally deadly silent. But then I'm thinking, I'm like, ah, I never seen a dog. All I seen was that red light. I never seen a dog. Never heard a dog. Never heard anybody shouting at it. But that was just my first instinct. I'm running and thinking that, and it's just it's my brain just thinking it is that. But when I was standing, I'm thinking, I never seen a dog. And I kind of something just at that moment. I just, I thought, I'm not going back that way because I was going to run out and go back. And I ran into the next town and I, and I ran into Bathgate and I ran back the streetlights because this, this crap toss. It, but the thing is, though, it changed my behaviour. I spoke to my wife about it and I told her about it. And the first thing I'd done is I bought a light. I bought a light that shone a, a, a prominent beam, right? Yeah. That was the very, very first thing I'd done. And I never ran there again at night, right? And the funny thing was... Uh, probably rationalised it for someday in the field, whatever, and I, I just parked at the back of my brain again. It wasn't until recently, I know in, it was in your book, there was a, a story in one of your books about, about that somebody. One, that one in the first book, on, because you reminded yeah. me, on the moors, and it, it paced them, didn't it, as they were walking. Aye. Is that the one where the car broke down? Yeah, yeah, there was that yeah, one. Yeah. And yeah. there was another time as well, where the first time I'd actually seen it, before reading that, it was a, a thing about Skinwalker Ranch, when they were talking about some of the older stories, and they talked about orbs and stuff like that, but there was this other thing they say. They said it was like a small red LED they would find flying in when they put the cattle. And and I said to my wife, I was like, I've seen that. Mm. She said, what do you mean? I said, I've seen that. I goes, can you remember that? No, remember years ago, I told you about this red light. I said, I goes, you don't remember. She goes, remember. Yeah. She goes, you talked about it for months. <laughs> and know, I, I forgot all about it. You, you know, you, uh, there'll be some people listening and they'll go, at what point from a laser pen? No, it wasn't there that. Were no there, were, there were no beam. Chris, there was no beam. There was no beam, and it, yeah. it flew. It flew between. It flew between gorse bushes, like in front and behind. So it's, it was nothing like that. It was yeah. nothing like a laser pen. I mean, I've got laser pens, and I'm no um, crazy enough to think it'd be that. It was, no, but to me, it was like, say, oh, that's, aye, aye, that's it. It's just, it's just that. Aye. But this thing, so I'd measured that, and it must have ran with me for at least about between seven hundred and fifty to five hundred meters. So that would have probably been at the time it'd be a, a good number of like about three minutes anyway or something. Two to three minutes. And and, and to actually intercept an omen on you, it, it kind of it, implied it, whatever it came, was. No, it came towards me and then ran with me for a bit of time. And it was only five to ten meters from me. It's almost like there's a little bit of well, there is there's some kind of connection there, isn't there? It's it's detected you, let's put it that way. Oh totally. Aye. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we'll just see whether Les. We'll jump back to Les see if he's got any more questions. But uh, interesting that Chris. Mm. Les. Yeah, that was a great, interesting account there, Chris. Uh, let's have a look. We do have some questions, but first of all, we are going to do a little bit of housekeeping here. And uh, first of all, I've got to thank everybody for uh, the great questions that are coming in tonight. We've got some more to read out for Chris later on, and uh, there's some great chat going on in the chat room tonight. So. Uh, I'm glad uh, people are enjoying it. Right, first of all, I've got to say, we're just going to do a little plug for Truth Proof webpage. 
and I think if this works out for me I can get the truth proof web page up on the screen there we go truth proof and uh, it's truth proof dot uk and if you go there and if I can just maneuver where we're yeah. going yeah there we go so we're scrolling down uh, all of Paul's books all four books are on there to buy uh, if you want reviews on the books please uh, please go to uh, Amazon for the reviews but don't buy from Amazon please buy from the websites and also on the website we have our reporting page and uh, on the reporting page you'll see a lot of the latest reports that have come in that have been reported uh, to the Truth Proof website and there's some fascinating accounts I can tell you and if you want to report as well um, you can there uh, do that on there as well so if you've got any great reports from this area and beyond then please go straight to the website and uh, put a report in there and don't forget if you want to buy any books please buy the books from there and not from Amazon so I think that's a little plug there Paul thank you very much Les it's, it's great yeah and I just need to say Don's worked hard on website revamping it to yeah, the I've just got to. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to say that. Also, uh, we've got a little plug for uh, Deb's tonight. Uh, she has a. Um, let's have a look. Deb's has got her. Um, is it kin? Is it a Kindle book? Deb's, I think it's on the screen now, and uh, just a little plug for you. It's a download. And if anybody wants to uh, read that uh, from our moderator tonight, Debbie Singleton, then that's up for sale on Amazon. And I think it's a great read and uh, well worth every penny of that. And it's not it's not expensive. It's, it's it is it's a great read. At some point, we're going to have to have Deborah on here and uh, listen to a few of these experiences and things that have happened to her. I think Les, don't you? Just oh yes, yes, moderate. definitely. It, it won't be any yep. time soon, Deb, because you can't moderate. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, I've just got to say one more thing. Uh, there will be uh, um, uh, addresses uh, for Chris to to um, uh, to get in contact with Chris. Uh, you've got a Facebook page, Chris, I guess, and you've got, have you got a, a website? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's great. I think we've got some links in tonight's uh, show notes, but uh, yeah, but uh, we'll uh, add them later if we have not. Okay then, guys, uh, I'll just go to a couple of questions then, if that's okay. And I just see, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, I'm not ignoring people. The only one I can see is Lee Roscoe for Wolflands. Thank you, it will be put to good use. And, and, and everyone else, thank you. Right, one less, sorry. Okay, right, yeah. Uh, I think we're just picking up from where we left off with the questions. It's um, uh, Justin Apple is asking, have you heard of any dogman sightings in Scotland? I know you said earlier, Chris, it wasn't your line of inquiry or investigation, but uh, the question's there, still the same. Not, not really, no since I've been podcasting, but the only thing I've actually heard that I've, that I've read in a a short while ago was the the Wolver, if you've, if you've heard of that story before. So in the Shetland, the Shetland Islands had a, a story gone back hundreds of years there, a wolfman type thing called the Wolver, who was a friendly wolf and he used to leave, apparently leave um, fish and things like that in people's windowsills yeah. and he lived at some ravine or whatever. Um, that was only one of the kind of stories. In fact, there was another one, in fact, where there was supposed to be... Um, a family werewolves on the Isle of Lewis gone back, dating back years and years and years again. And it's supposed to be buried there or whatever, but I've not heard, apart from just reading that on the net, I've no research I looked at in or heard anything coming through in that regard. Is it, is, is it something that you'd, you'd like to look into or have you just got enough on to be find yourself... No, in totally interested in it. I mean, I, I've been listening to... Obviously, the, I've been listening to the stories that's happened in, in Munich of the Woods and down there, and there's been a few stories that I've heard 
for America as well, which are, are pretty um, compelling as well. Um, for, for a police officer, this was one in the, the Sasquatch Chronicles, and it was uh, a, a few good ones. I mean, really, really yeah. good ones. Um, yeah, that, that, that's great. Uh, I've got a comment uh, from our moderator, Deborah, tonight, and she's actually saying, now, uh, just go careful with this one, Chris, when I mention it. She's saying, can I recommend Chris to play the next James Bond? <laughs> I think I'm as, I'm as fit as Daniel Craig anyway. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, so just just bear that in mind. Uh, if you do any more TV appearances, uh, Chris, so, you, uh, could, uh, you could be nominated for the next James Bond. Next Bond uh, and you'll certainly be nominated Deborah. by Deborah. Yeah, <laughs> certainly nominated by Deborah. Okay, now on to something a little bit more... Uh, in line of what we're talking about and uh steve lewis chris have you ever heard of any ufo sightings reports from guys that work on the oil rigs that's a great question that no good question no uh, me personally no i know there was ones going back years ago when there was ones that's been highlighted by the ufo investigators of the day when there was there was two jets seen with a, a, a flying triangle at one point um at Aberdeen, but Apart from that, that was done with the UFO investigators that day. I don't know if it was, if it was either one holiday or if it was maybe Malcolm Robinson. But um, but no, no, no personal myself, no. Okay. Uh, and I'll just finish off this session with a question from Rebecca King. Uh, I think she's going back to the uh, red orb, Chris. Uh, Chris, did the orb change size or remain the same size despite the distance it was away from you? That's a good, good question, I. It seemed the same size all the time, to be honest with you. No, it's just a, a small red LED, if you could describe it as that. That's an interesting question, that. No. Well, that is why I said to you earlier, in, as you were talking about it, how big? Because when it got closer, I'm assuming it's gone, got bigger, do you see? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's all for questions for now, guys. Right, let's, uh, let's move on then. So where do you want to go now? You want to touch on some of the... Things well, that we're going to talk about. Yeah, look, there's there's one last story. Well, the only kind of other thing, kind of UFO related, that I'd seen personally with a, a few friends. We were, were out fishing one night, um, and it's not a, a mega great UFO sighting or anything, but we were, it's, we're talking about, when you talk about the intermind connection um, with the light phenomenon and stuff like that, yep. um, we were looking at a, a satellite, satellite coming across the sky. It was dark, pretty, pretty dark, but you could see all the stars really, really great night clear night and you've seen the satellite normal kind of satellite size speed maybe a wee bit faster it was coming towards another star so it was traveling as far as i could see a uh, horizon line coming up and where we were it was kind of coming towards above us and we said i don't know who said it within the group but we said uh, we were out fishing and it was like in between the towns and it was like pretty dark so you could go street lights and stuff like that so um we said funnily enough I wonder what it's going to do when it hits that star. Thinking, we know it's not going to do and it's going to pass, just past it. Yeah. I mean, but it got to the star and a total 90 degree turn. It, yeah. added, it was like L shape and it just kept going in the other direction. I mean, so a satellite's not going to just, it's, it didn't yeah. arc or nothing, it just a total 90 degree turn. As soon as it hit that, it just went that way. Did you, did you obviously, we know we, we, you'll never know, but did you feel like talking about it uh, some, somehow? Prompted it. I can't I, I remember. I think we did talk about it at the time, but that was it. I didn't it? it just kind of um it just got chalked up to just a, a satellite strange thing. That was it. We didn't really tell any investigators about it in, in back in the day or anything. I think at the time I must have only been about early twenties or something. Um but ah, it was it was just a, a mad V sighting in this in the same area. And that's the thing I'll touch on now is like the amount of different things that's been in this area. No, no, predominantly at the same at the same time. But through the years, there's been there's been quite a lot here. You know what I mean? So you've got to give you a, an idea to where I'm situated. You've got some of the the most prominent kind of UFO cases that I've done where they've been they've already been researched and, and investigated by investigators of the day. But like during the nineties, for example, um, you've got the whole kind of we say Bonnie Bridge Falkirk flap that went on, and it was like hundreds of sightings, like over like three hundred sightings. Yeah. different craft lights 
even people seeing things as in like aliens and stuff like that. There was like loads of kind of stuff going on in that time. And um, that was like during the kind of 90s period from the late 80s to like maybe up to the late 90s. And from here, that area is it's like 10, 15 miles away, right? So that way, you've got about eight miles that way, you've got the, the Bob Taylor incident, which happened in 1979. Prominent um, abduction case, police involved. So they'd seen a metallic craft, um, Malcolm Robinson was one of the ones he investigated back in the day. Um, you've seen two of these um, metallic type creatures or, or, or kind of landmine type things with um, legs in them came out. The man blacked out. Um, he did missing time and all that kind of stuff. Um, he had these trousers all ripped that I tried to, the things like to drag him. The police investigated that. They seen like tracks for this, they seen landing marks and that. And I think even at the day, it was it's still, it's, I'm sure it's still accounted the police is um, as assault by unknown persons really? or something like that. I, I think it is something like that. So the police were involved in that. That's like you're talking eight miles for here. Yeah. You've got the Armadale kind of black triangle and Andrew, Andrew Swan, 94, five miles that way. You've got um, the A70 encounter with two guys back in 92, I think it was. The, um, it was a, a, a kind of prominent abduction case. I mean, that there's like 15 miles, 16 miles that way. So you, you've got a lot of different stuff and there's stuff happening to, the still stuff comes through, as I was saying earlier on, where people had seen um, stuff just before COVID and stuff like lights in the sky and things like that. And it's it's the, the mad things that you 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 don't realise or, the story, as I say, the story is out there that you, you, you don't get a chance to hear or see, you know what I mean? And, and it's like, one of the ones I'll, I'll touch on a wee bit once I kind of, I'll go through some of these stories when I kind of started the podcast. So when I kind of go to kind of get into starting a podcast, it's still early days. I mean, I've, I've not been doing this for a whole lot of time. I just want to try and find out more what's out there and locally and kind of nationally and even further than that. Yeah. And be talking about some of the more prominent cases as well, that it gets the kind of ball rolling and then it gets people coming out of the woodwork and you, you get kind of more of them and that and you want to hear more of them. But the one where, for example, one of the first cases, um, uh, I never even I had any interest in the cryptid scenario until I started watching um, your own stuff, Paul, yeah. and seeing the Baltic kind of phenomena stuff that was happening down there. And then I heard off a, a story on one of the, like basically it's like it's called the Bathgate Hills Group, which is just a, a group where people take pictures of wildlife and walks and, and, and stuff like that in the area and about the history and all that kind of stuff. And somebody had mentioned um, stories about the Silverman case. And I never knew what it was. So I looked into it a wee bit more and I managed to track the guy down. And uh, I spoke to him. So he had any, I think he'd talked about the case gone back, it was 88, but it hadn't really relayed it that much. And I hadn't anybody interviewed him about it and all that kind of stuff. But he maybe talked a wee bit about it and, and people had heard the story and it's on the net and stuff like that. But needed actually, he said, you're the first person that's actually came to me and heard the whole story and talked about it and stuff. And so he managed, I managed to get him and we talked on location and the way this, the story goes this is basically it's like five miles from here right so and, so it's called the silverman case the yes, silverman silverman yes that's it's yeah. because i talk really really fast and yes, okay, <laughs> so, but, um, so the silver man he was it was in 88 he was driving in the bathgate hills and the bathgate hills uh, is the pretty prominent hills in the area it probably spans over the radius, maybe a 10 mile radius, and they only go up to maybe a thousand feet, if not slightly more than that. They're no massive hills. Um, so there's a bit of forestry, some country parks, and there's like dotted farmland in between. So this guy was driving me, his wife and kids in 88, and basically done his, his weekly shop. And then he was got to go home, and he was just taking the kids for a wee drive, and, playing a game with them and they'll say, what way do you want to turn? Well, we go left or right and then they would get down to go this way and he'd go the other way and then he'd turn and just playing a game. And it was 88, he'd no longer bought the new car. So he was kind of wet go for a drive in it as well. And it was a kind of, a, a kind of cold, crisp night, he said it was. It was like either like November or, or whatever it was, it was like quite cold and it was in like the winter time. So it was like darker earlier, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So Bathgate Hills, it's just kind of like um, single track roads. He's driving round, driving round, and he comes round this bend and he sees this um, 
what he described it was a flash first. He seen a flash, and then he said it happened really, really, really quickly. But what they seen was it was a thing crouched down at the side of the road and next to the fence. And when the car came round, it stood up and it ran. It ran through the fence and came round in a semicircle at the same time looking over his shoulder. And he said it was the kids, and as soon as they got they got round the corner, right, the, the wife said to the husband, did you see that? And the kids shouted, um, you've seen the silver man. And the, the reason they said it was a silver man is because it, it, the colour of it, he said it looked more like a kind of ethereal light type thing. He said it, you could see it had structure to it. It wasn't a see-through. He said if you could, uh, the way he described it was, if you look at an old negative picture and you see the outline of somebody in the negative and they're like, it's like black and white and they're like a kind of white or colour. He goes, that's what it looked like. He said it wasn't a silver. It was more like it looked to me, it looked like a negative and it looked like an old picture. And he said it was bulky. He said it was pretty bulky and he ended up, this, this thing ran and, and disappeared and it was like this wood um, called Raven's Craig Wood and it's a small wood and all that kind of stuff. And um, in that area though as well, so they, they got that, there's a bit more of the story where they, they'd all seen it, so the family's seen this thing. It ran through the fence. That's what, it, that was my question, it ran through the fence. But it ran through it the fence. Didn't break the fence no, though. It no. didn't break it, but it ran through it. So it ran through the fence along and then a semicircular and then disappeared. But they, they, at this point they'd kind of turned the corner and over the hill. And there's a bit more to the story after that because they say that he, he couldn't remember much after that and he tried to do a bit of regression or self-regression and stuff because he worked in um, kind of health and stuff and he said he knew to do that and he, he kept going through the whole process and he'd get, he'd get so far away and then he would just he would get to just past seeing it and then he, he, he couldn't go any further. It was like he would just come against like a black wall that he couldn't get around and it was funny but it was so that story it was like totally plausible i mean spoke to the guy and we were there for on site for a like a, a good number of hours like going through a lot to do it and stuff and it was quite interesting and what he said but one of the things he said as well he said i don't know why i thought this he said but it was for the, the quick time i seen it it seemed to be it, it didn't have a face he said but I, it was like this impression in my head it was turning round the back looking at me and scribbling he said, but I don't know how I, I perceive it to be like that because I can't remember it having a face. And me and my wife discussed this on occasion. They said, we discussed it for a good while. Why did we think that when we didn't see a face on it? And um, so that was the Kenny Silverman case we see in this thing. How tall, Chris? You he, know, said it was big. He, said, he said it was big. He said it was like about seven feet. He said it was like yeah, a, yeah. He said it was big and it was bulky. He said it wasn't like a, uh, I've seen it, I've seen it described in another, podcast this thing it ran really fast and it did run fast but he said it was like a, a big bulky thing so so um, you're the first person that's actually at, knocked on his door or gone to meet him and that, that aye. Him face. aye aye so he told the story a, a while back and one of the think it was like flyer flying saucer review to somebody or something like that but just kind of in written form or whatever and i don't know if it got published or no whatever but the story was banned about a wee bit but nobody really actually kind of sat down and, and went through the whole kind of thing with him and, um, that, that's that's brilliant research, then, isn't it? And I I I, I hope that you're going to push for a little bit more. You maybe will do. I mean, it's it, worth talking to again. It has, got, it has got a few more stories and stuff, and but there's some interesting things that tie into the area as well. So that area, right next to it, I mean, right next to it, you've got uh, burial mounds that are like five and a half, it's like five thousand years old. Right, it's like called Cairn Papal, yeah. right next to it. You've got other bits in that area as well. It's like predominantly it's the one of the highest bits in the area. And it's got like an old, it's one of the oldest henges. It's like a wooden henge. And it's like they've got burial bits up there. And then years later, the Christians came and buried their own dead on it to obviously to try and take over whatever it was. And um so I it's quite a strange area. I mean, and there's been UFO reports up there um quite recently as well. So there's like there's there's ones that was no it's came through me. You know what I mean? This has came through other websites and stuff where People had seen like um, like silver orbs with, or with things going on about it and stuff like that. And the interesting thing, it ties into another kind of story, right? But to, to give you, the, the, the mad thing with this story is, and it ties in a few things with me, right? Is I went on site with him 
I went on site with him and done the recording. It was 50 metres to where I had the panic, where I stopped and had that fear. All right, yeah. Going back 20 years prior. Absolutely mad. And it was at the time I knew when I went and I met him, and I was like, this is the same place. I'd been in that, I'd been in that with a wee bit after because when I, when I found out roughly about the story, and I went in, but ever since, ever since that thing happened, I hadn't been in there until I heard of that story. And it was in, and I never, I never felt any weirdness then or, or, or since. But the funny thing is, when I was talking about it, and I said to my wife, and she's, and she even she said, because you've been in there, she's like, was it there you were talking about? She was, she was that place is funny. So there is a weird feeling in there. And that's good. It's for her to say that. It's it's quite mad for her to say that. I don't know how you fixed time wise, Chris, for researching the, this. Mm -hmm. You know, because I know you're busy with other things, but it might be good to put a few paragraphs together and contact local paper and see if you can revive any stories from around that area, highlighting the Silverman story, your experience, just briefly. Yeah. And getting leaving a number and an email address, and you'd be surprised. I mean, that's how the Willstorp story came to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, 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 Probably will do that. I'll take that advice and do that. And there's, the funny thing is, and another thing where it links in is not another, another even. It's just coincidence, right? But um, the, the funny thing is, it's, it skips a town. It skips like the Bathgate, and there's this other town next to it. And there's been UFO sightings and stuff like that throughout the years, right across this area. And it's not as if they're happening every day, but when you pull them all together, it looks a lot, right? But when um, that area, right, that area, he stayed, he said to me, he was, I stayed um, about a mile and a half from where this happened, right? And he said, that's not the only thing that's happened to me. He said, I had a lot of other experiences when I was younger. Um, when I was, I stayed in this bitty town, it's just basically about a mile and a half of this place. And he said, I had like, it was almost kind of like an abduction scenario where he went missing when he was a younger kid. And then he said, he stayed in this, this street, in this house, um, and he said a lot of stuff happened when he was younger. It continued to happen when he was a wee bit older with his family and that. And he said it was, it was, he kind of thought it was linked to that place, right? And the interesting thing was, but I never even clicked until after it, was when my sleep paralysis started, it was the same street, the exact same street. Because I didn't even stay in that town. I stayed, I, I went and stayed with my, my friend a few towns over, which was that place. And I went and checked it, and it was like literally doors for where he stayed and had these locational. Local activity, you know, it's, it's it's really honestly, it's made your earlier account even more interesting now, hasn't it? You know, uh, one of the mad things for that story, right? Where I'd, I was just getting into it, and I had a few kind of booked in, and, and I was um, I had a basically podcasting a few, and I was back up the Bathgate Hills, and I, I got and take pictures and again and stuff, and good and try and just get out, the same as what you do now and again, and when I get time and go for a walk and, and go at different times and stuff and, and, and do that to try and... Um, I go and take pictures of the sunset and stuff like that now and again. So I was actually trying to get pictures of the sunset this night and it was during all the, the deep snow we had. And um, it's, I've, the people... Look, on this, I've seen these two people walking up as I was parking my, my car and stuff. And on the way back, they taking some pictures of the sunset was setting. And... Uh, this is just like this is just to, to tell you what people keep to themselves, right? And it's like astounding. Yeah. So I was um, I was walking back to my car because the sun was setting. It was getting a bit dark. It was, it was freezing cold, and I bumped into this couple coming out of that wood. And I and I said to them, "Does that path take you up to the top of the hill?" Because I hadn't seen the path they'd come out before. And uh, I was walking back to my car. And I was going to go up there before I left before it got totally dark. And they said, "Yes, yes." I, and they started talking about cameras and, and any pictures and sunsets and stuff like that. And that was it. I didn't really um, um, talk about anything else. And then when I was going to go in, they said, oh, if you go that way, you just follow the trail up. And I said, well, hopefully the silver man doesn't get me. Right? Just like off cuff remarks. I was interested to see if they heard the story before or if they, they'd heard the podcast. Right? So, and then the woman, the woman said, why? Uh, and I said, well, I said, oh, I, was like, I, I didn't see that podcast. I just said, oh, somebody had relayed a story that they'd seen something. Um, years before along there and she goes oh well, what did you see and and was it like some type of cryptid thing or something I said aye and, and I can't explain that and this, she looked at her husband and said um, well we've seen sand and I was expecting them to say um, like something like that like the silver man or the, a cryptid thing or something and I said what did you see and they said well going back um, in October I thought this was probably January I think it was 
And as he'd gone back in October, we had seen a large sphere, a large sphere come over the back here and then disappeared behind the hill. He said it was like a definite sphere, like a light sphere, big. And uh, and I said, that's, that's mad. I said, like, and, I, and I, so I told him about the podcast and stuff. And I said, I need to get a story. And then they told me another story. The, the, the guy had told me a story from when he was younger. I'm not going to get the detail because he's no came on the podcast and he's no um, came back to relay the story. But he said he will. Um, and he's in time. But he basically had a sighting when he was younger that predated the Bob Taylor sighting in the same area. Right. He'd also seen a black triangle, like a large black triangle. Uh, and his wife had seen like an orb in the same area. And it was like the total plausible people, a couple in their 50s. And it's because I was talking about, they came up with the story. And I said, look, I need to get these, I need to get these stories of you. <laughs> I need to do, we want to talk about it. And they said, aye, but I've not put my name out there. So I wasn't about to be intrusive and say, give me your phone number or whatever else. And I didn't have my phone number for the podcast at the time. So I said, that's my email address. It's easy to find. It's on that. And they never contacted me. And I was like kicking myself. So I went up there. I walked up there even more <laughs> and ran there even more. And I got them. I, I seen them again. It was recently I seen them again. And they told me some more stories um, as well. And the guy said, like, I will come back to you. I just wasn't really, I didn't really feel comfortable talking on thing. And it was, but I, I will relate and stuff like that. But he told me a few other things as well, which was quite, um, quite amazing as well. But uh, hopefully they'll come back and, and tell the story. Uh, but it's amazing just what you bump into. And that was just a, a chance meeting. It kind of tells us, doesn't it, that just a random meeting, and I've done it. I've done it while I've been with Bob Brown. Me and me and Les have bumped into people, and they've got things to tell you. You, mm -hmm. the, the the things that are, they're not locked away in the mind, but the things that are so bizarre they don't want to talk about. But as soon as they get somebody stood in front of them, who not being pushy, not being forceful, but you tell them what you're about and what you're doing, and they've got a little story to tell. Some most at time, I won't say some at time. Most at time, they'll say, "But I don't want to." I'll tell you it, but I don't want to, my name used. I don't want this or that. But yeah. we've come across it. We come across it doing Wolflands, myself and Les, when we mm. went to explain to two ladies, farmers, why mm. we were, I don't know, why we were on edges of their land filming and things, and they'd seen big cats. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, and it were, it were almost blase how they said it. You know, it says, I, would, uh, I know they exist. I saw two great big paws sticking mm. out of gauze, well, you know, the gauze bushes below while I'm tending to sheep and I just looked and there's a head there and it's a panther. This is up around Howard Dale. You know, it's, it's nuts. But and the stories are there you're, and you're, you're proof of it with the people you're speaking to. Amazing as well. You, there's been big cat stories here as well. And the guy on the podcast with the Silver Man said as well, he goes, there's been a, a good few big cat signs and you can find it on actually the big cat website. And it's not a, no a paranormal site or nothing like that. It's like they just record big cat sightings um, in the yeah. UK. And uh, there's been multiple ones in West Lothian, around about this area. And the, when the guy relayed the, the, the Solomon story, he said there was one in Bog Hall where there was an older man. He, he, had to, he was swiping his hat at it to get it away. He said this thing was on the street. It was like a big black cat. Um, and there's been sightings in them. But it's just that, that story there, there was just the one add on to the Solomon because it linked into it. But... It was just because these stories are there and it's just it's, it's trying to relay them. But the one I was talking about earlier on with the Black Triangle, different story where it was uh, Andrew Swan was um, from Armadale and he stayed around the corner from me. Does this relate to the Mick Park question earlier? You said you'd talk about it, didn't you? Yes, yes. I right, so, so he stayed around the corner from me. And this story's been, it's been in, it's probably been a few books before and it was even on Strange But True. Um, but it was for all the stories he had talked about uh, through the years. This one, did they, I just didn't, didn't think it got like, any light at all. Or, and I was always interested in it because I was from Armadale and I, I knew the guy. He, he stayed next door to one of my friends and I knew him because he stayed in the same area and stuff. And he was uh, the same age as one of my sisters. So I kind of I found him and I reached out to him and I said, Look, would you be willing to? Um, even for the not just for the podcast, I was more interested myself. I wanted to go and hear the story and and go to the spot and find out more about it. So um, he he agreed to come and meet me and and relay the story. So he took me to the spot where it happened and stuff. And so the story goes, he was coming back from I can't remember what event he was at. He was at something. He was driving anybody with friends. He dropped him off, and there was a lightning storm further out towards the south in the town or like to the south direction anyway. 
So he drove up to a, a good vantage point, which is the 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 high school playing fields at the back. So the high the high school playing fields, and then you've got it's surrounded by like a banky like um, fir trees, which are quite high, but you can still see it out the back. So he said he was up there parked, and then beyond the trees and in the cloud line, not cloud line, it was like there was clouds and sky and stuff like that. But beyond the trees, it was still light. This was like an, an August night, so it was like. 11 o'clock or something, but it said it was still light because at that time of night in Scotland, it was still quite bright and stuff. And you could see this, it looked like a, I'm sure at the time it looked like a, a rectangle, a black kind of rectangle. And and then he could see the shape here. And he, and he thought, he said this thing, it was, it was coming towards where he was, and he said he thought it was going to land in the actual playing fields. But then it didn't, it was still kind of hanging there and it was just still further away. I think it was just the vantage point, the way he was looking at it. It, it wasn't as close as they thought or, or whatever, it was something like that. So he to get a better vantage point of this thing, he got in his car and he drove along about three miles into the next town and then drove through the town and went to the back roads and to come back into Armadale again for the back roads. So if you imagine from the high school and right out to that road, it's just farmland and mossland. So he drove out and drove along and as he was driving, he couldn't see it in the sky. And he was coming past this bank of trees. He said it came across the top of his car, right? And what it was, he said it was like a a black, I think it was a black grey or something, I think matte black. Um, it was, if you can imagine a Toblerone, right? See a Toblerone. So a Toblerone with the point pointing down the way, right? So if you, he said it was about 40 feet long, right? Um, 15 feet like thick. So at the point here, the Toblerone, it actually went down to a point. So it was like a Toblerone all along. The back it was splayed wider. And the front it went down to a kind of point. So it was like, if you can imagine it, it was... I've, I've got like a... On one of the podcasts, that actually made a, an arts impression there type thing. We just be mucking about with some of the kind of the Google stuff. And I, I pinged him a few messages and I said, is that it? And he came back and said, no, the, the corners are more rounded and stuff and, and this and that. So, so anyway, this thing... Missed his car, just missed his car. Proceeded to go into the field and stop in the field, and it was only literally a hundred feet from, right? If that, sitting about fifteen feet above the ground, hanging on the ground, right? This thing, it's like forty series, forty feet long, fifteen feet high, any wide type thing, and a bit wider at the back. It's displayed wider at the back and a bit lower. And it, it, it kind of like down to a point at the front, and a. Uh, he said basically that this thing sat there and he was in his car and he was watching it for X amount of minutes. It was, it was, it was a good bit of time he was, he was watching it. It was just hanging there. And no so, lights? What's that, sorry? No, no lights at all. It was just, this, at this point, it was starting to get a bit dark because it was, he drove up there probably the back of 11 or 11 o'clock or whatever and it was starting to get dark because it was, he's seen it, it was still light because it was August and August night, summer night. So he's seen this thing. He, um, he drove up there, his car was parked he, what he done is it was getting a bit darker, so he had one of the big halogen lights in his car, the ones with the, the, the hand trigger on it. So he plugged it in his car, shone a light on it, and as soon as he did that, his light blew. Right? So he, he jumped back in his car, tried to start, got a fright, tried to start his car, his car wouldn't start. So he phones the police, he's had a mobile phone at this point, he phoned the police. And um, so he phones the police, and they're like, right, right, we'll come, blah, blah, blah. So he's still there, and then... Um, he phones him again because they were taking too long or something, and then they, they come or whatever. So he said this thing. He said it was sitting there, and he said I'm, the police must have seen it because they came along the road, and this thing just backed off. It didn't turn. It didn't go up. He said it just backed off the same way, the same way it came in. And it just backed off and then shot off and disappeared, right? And he said they appeared, and the he said the thing was that when the police came, they had it was like three police cars there, right? And a van or whatever, like it was like either two or three police cars or a van or whatever. And they say they went and picked up um, the what like must have been like the inspector or, or, or one of the, the higher up ones in the police because they said the guy had his slippers on, right? Yeah. Had his slippers on, so they must have went and got him to his bed and then brought him as well. And he said the funny thing was they were talking to me and they, they could tell that I wasn't drinking and they could tell it wasn't the kind of person that went out drinking and all that kind of stuff. It was into cars and all that. And, um, and all that kind of stuff, right? And so he, they could tell that he was telling the truth. And he said, the funny thing was, one of the police guys in another car jumped the fence and put a cone where the thing was sitting in the field. 
You see, I never told him at that point where it was. And then um, they took him, they took him home and all that kind of stuff. And it's, I'm sure they seen something on the way home and, and they didn't see the seat or whatever. But he ended up, he, he got home and it wasn't until they started looking into the, the case. Now, in fact, I'll tell a lie. I'm going to tell a lie. But before he went home, they had to get the, the A8 to come and get his car or the REC or whatever it was. And because his car wouldn't start. And then after that, his car just started the next day. His car it didn't start that time, started the next day. They got somebody to come out for the A or uh, I can't remember if it was A or REC, and they checked over his car. And they said the only way that would have happened, they cut it out like that, would have been um, electric, electric magnetic kind of thing. I mean, you near power lines and all that kind of stuff. And they said, no, there's nothing up there at all. And um, but it, it was, they, they were kind of baffled with it. They, kind of, they sent some to it to check all over the car and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was that. And then with further investigations by, by, by people in the day, because there were people kind of looking into it, they got the transcripts of the police. And he's actually, he's called, didn't he go into the police and talk something like, I can't remember the exact thing, but it was something like half two. So he had like something like an hour and a half or two hours of missing time because he was up there. And he only thought the thing, the actual sighting only happened like 15 to 20 minutes. But the time the police came, it was a lot later. But when they checked the transcripts of the police and the time and all that kind of stuff, and it correlated to a lot later. So there was missing time there. And they said it was it was totally mad. He was on, and he wasn't that kind of, I, I knew who he was and all that. And he wasn't the type of guy who would like fabricate the truth and, and go on about the story and that. And he was taken quite serious. He said it was funny because his, his mum and dad were on holiday and it was in the papers and all that. And um, they seen it on holiday before he told them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it was on. I think it was the Daily Record. It was one of the main papers of the day. It was an I Did they name it? I think they did. I, I. <laughs> um, and then um, other things that happened as well. There was um, what was it? It was unstrange but true. And he, he said, "I've never even watched that because no, no. <laughs> they just went that kind of guy." And, but it was, it was good enough to, to show me the area and the story. But it was like. At the time, it got relayed in some of the documentaries at the time and all that kind of stuff, but never ever touched on again. And I, always, I think it was in one book or something. I kind of thought it was such a great story because the police involved, there's so much evidence in about it and all that kind of stuff, and just where it was and all that. And he stays in that vicinity now. He stays up there, like just like a, a farm, no far from where the sighting was. And he said, I've actually seen things, like recently. And he, and he as I was saying, so he said it was either... In the last year or so, he'd, he'd seen, um, same again, it was like a, a sphere with something going on about it. And he showed, he showed me, the, he sent me the video. It's hard to see the video. It's like a massive uh, kind of bright light and you see just a, a flicker of lights going on about it. But it was, it was, it wasn't a plane, too big of a plane, but it was different. But he sent me the video, but it's hard to, it's lights in the sky. Is he, is he staying in area because he wants to see now? Has it sort of triggered him? I'm not sure. Like The thing is, he said that, I did have that discussion with him when I done the podcast, and he said he has listened to some things during the years, but he's still not been extremely involved in it. Uh, reading between the lines, I think he's been looking at some stuff and and things like that, a wee bit of interest, but not outwardly at all or anything. Yeah. And but in that area, the funny thing in that area, he's up there, and he said he's seen things, a few things in that area, like odd type things in the sky, lights and that. But they stay in a flight path, so we know what planes look like. Yeah, in different planes. So from what he's seen. And described, um, that was that. But where the other sighting came from, um, my old neighbour, who looked up that way, it was the same vicinity for where he stayed and where he said these things. So it all kind of ties in. Yeah. And then there's been sightings in the Bathgate Hills where there's been um, there's been like sphere type things as well. Where like it's, I think one of the recent sightings, this did they come to me. This was for like one of the, the web pages where they seen like a sphere type thing. Where it, I think they described it was like Mercury going round about it. It was like a white sphere with mercury or light with, with kind of lights that going on about that. Um, but I totally interested in them. I mean, that it, was that it one. It really is. And do you know, Chris, you, you kind of do yourself a bit of a disservice because you say, I'm not a researcher. Yet you've spoken to people that other researchers have never spoken to, yet it's been written about and documented. So mm -hmm. I, I think I think you you you, you really are. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's got to be said. I mean, me and Les went to Siltho Moor. I don't know, Les will tell you, probably three weeks. No, it's got to be more, six weeks ago. And uh, there's a story there. I'm not going into detail. We ain't got time and we want to hear more about you. But there's a story there of a, an alleged flying saucer, a tiny saucer that landed in 1957. 
we got to speak to some people on Sil uh, up at Silfo, 12 houses, who would live there all their lives. Nobody had ever been to speak to them. <laughs> do, do, do you know? Do you know? That is what I don't know what research is. If if that if if that weren't the first thing that anybody should have done, and mm. you're doing it, so don't, don't ever say you don't research. Chris, I mean, I mean that that story that story because it was like a a story from the area and a story from it was maybe documented in years gone back. It was investigated years ago at the time, but um, because I I knew him mm. and, I, and I stayed in the town, I wanted to know more about the story. Um, there was other stories for the area. There's another one as well. Like back in, I think it was '82, there was um, two policemen had seen a UFO. They said it looked like a, a flying clothes pole, like one of the, like a long tube thing thing. And there was another one as well where the two brothers I know who seen the same thing from a different angle but described something differently. They've never came out before about that. Um, but I know kind of their story from it as well. And it's just it's just mad what you find and and what people can kind of come to you and. As I was saying, there's like when I touched, somebody talked about the um, the Falkirk area and stuff. Um, as I said, this story is a new story. It just came in the last uh, few weeks, and I can't. Rec um, I've got it in audio, um, that, but I can't even recount it in audio for the fact that to protect the, the guy's anonymity. But I'll relay the story and stuff. And, and I said, Deep, I'd let you listen to it because the guy. I actually put him on to try to listen to some of your stuff as well because some of the descriptions. Uh, um, some of the things that kind of like the night people in, in that regard yeah. as well, where he, from an early age, to, to, to paint the picture, I'm not going to get too much detail, but to paint the picture, he stayed in an area where it was in and around about the Falkirk Triangle. You know, and if you could call it that, there's that area right around about there where it's yeah. West Lothian Falkirk, where a lot of kind of things had happened over the years. And uh, he's could have stayed in, um, out in the country, right in the epicentre of all that when it was going on at the time. And from an early age, what he described was um, he would see them first outside his house, looking out the window, and it was like um, the typical kind of grey alien, but more like white, like a white or really pale skin, like um, or like fleshy skin rather than like a grey. He did say he said like a grey thing once. He said, but other than that, it's um, it was always like a. Um, the kind of white, really, really, really pale faces. He said he couldn't even take his cell to watch communion because he was still that scared about that and stuff like that. But he would see these things outside his house and they were just like, it was like um, a pier in his room. And he, he can't remember much like abduction scenarios or anything like that, but that's what he'd have. And he would just be hiding under his covers and he would appear in them and again. And he'd know sometimes when they were coming, he would see it was always like a, a green mist light mist stroke thing and his room would appear um, and sometimes it was as if it was like he said you could see the, the green light shining as if it was like coming like through the wardrobe and even like in another wardrobe but it was actually like passing through the wall type thing and then these things would, would, would come in but they're always like um, these pale skin type kind of aliens that they are or no whatever they are I don't know if aliens are no whatever they are but you would see them and it, it would happen throughout his his lifetime in some of these houses and he, he kind of moved away and came back to the, one of the houses that he stayed in and um, I'm probably not doing the story justice because I need to kind of listen to it again to go through it but we kind of with a, a two-hour chat totally plausible guy and I can understand why he's um, he's not going to do it through his job and stuff like that or like get it related. Well, but, a responsible job then you don't he wanted to tell, I just wanted to tell somebody the story he said I'm happy for you to recount it as long as you leave my name out um, he said, if I was a lot higher up in my job, I wouldn't, I wouldn't care about relaying it. He said, but now I've still got a bit of the ladder to climb, so I'm not going to do it. You can understand because of the stigma there and stuff. Although it's getting a bit more acceptable these days, um, you still know there's a bit of stigma there and yeah. uh, ridicule and, and all that. So he, he'd seen these these things for years. Um, and then um, it, when he moved back, there was a thing he'd seen as well. No scene, but when he moved in to the house with his uh, girlfriend or wife, They'd heard this growling, a, a growling in the house as well, like something like a, like some type of animalistic thing growling in the house, and then it, it took a, a, I think it was a few months or something, and it, it eventually disappeared. But he would still see these things, and right up to a kind of later age, and he got to the point where he would, he, he got kind of strong will with it and faced them out, so it was like he was like he was just like no hiding from them anymore, and then they would they would kind of fade back and disappear sometimes. 
And one of the, the strangest accounts of the whole kind of thing, there's a lot to it, there is an awful lot to it, and he even says, like, seeing, like, shadow things, and his he's, kids now have, have said they've seen things, like um, black things moving about, corner of the eye, and it's just keeping an eye on it and all that kind of stuff and, and that. But one of the kind of st strangest bits of the tale where he told, he was on holiday, and he was abroad, and he had, um, he wasn't drinking because he had a car, he hired a car, and he was with his friend. And he basically, he said he said he had like one pint or something like that, and then they were out and, and met a few girls or whatever, and then he went back to the apartment and he'd fell asleep. And he could mind the ink, he was lying face down, and he woke up and he could see T's, T's side, he said it was like a um, a, a fleshy coloured thin leg, like long leg, right? He said, but it looked like, if you ever see a fly's leg really, really, really close up, yeah. It's, got, it's got the hairs in it. He said it had the black hairs in it, right? The black mm. hairs kind of sticking out, but this was like fleshy, coloured with black hairs. And uh, and when he got up to, to the, there was other there was other beans there, different beans there, like the the, the same kind of skin coloured ones that were there, like the the, the grey looking type ones, but they were skin coloured. Name, they were there as well. But he said this thing, whatever it was, there he turned round to see what it was, and he got up and turned round, and he said it was almost like it got a fright or was it, it was a, a bit kind of taken aback that he came, he came out he's stupid or whatever he turns around and he said this thing was um, over him, over the top of him at the head of the bed and it had, he seen its, its hand it said its hand was just like three, three nubs or three, he said it was like no fingers, it was just like three kind of like nub type things um, on the end of the hand type thing and he said when it's when he kind of got up and turned round, it came towards him and he said, it was funny, it was kind of like, it was like unsteady in his feet and it, it put his, like, his head into my head like that and I blacked out. Um, and it said it had, the face it had was between, between one of the things and an insect type thing. That's what it was, it was like that. And he said that happened when he was in his early 20s. Uh, on and, holiday. Uh, on holiday. Yeah. And he said, the mad thing was when he was there, there was like a, a news kind of report about somebody seeing that like people seeing a UFO or something like that. He didn't even, he, he said he, he couldn't, he, it was like the next morning or something, he'd seen someone on TV about that, but he couldn't understand it because it was in, it was in like a different language or whatever, I mean, but yeah. he said it's just funny. Um, that, but interesting story all the same. Possible. Is, possible. Is that, well, when you find out more about that, Chris, it's, I think we'd, we'd love to hear some more as well. So we just, because we've only got about eight minutes left to, if that we'll just see if Les has got any more questions for you mate yes uh, that's uh, some great accounts there uh, Chris uh, from uh, that report um, I've got a question and I don't I, do you know you'll, you'll be able to put me right you guys I don't know if I've asked this one already but it's from Jane, Jane Louise Bowery uh, Chris any men in black stories stroke UFO sightings well I think you've done the UFO sightings but men in black will stick with did I ask yeah, that one no, recently, didn't. recently, yeah, there was a, I had um, on the podcast, somebody from Midlothian was on, and they said they'd had a, a kind of men in black type sighting years ago for an area in Midlothian where there was a lot of sightings as well. And with alleged kind of, I don't know what it was, but he kind of thought there was like something going on in that area. And they were trying to get into this certain kind of, it was an old kind of military base and stuff like that. And he'd said... Um, this guy, a uh, kind of men in black type guy, had, had kind of chased him out, and he turned up at their house, his house, like that night, but wearing different clothes and stuff, and we with some different story about looking for some person or whatever. But it was just a, a strange account. It was in the it was in one of the podcasts, the Midlothian a phenomenon, uh, but that was the only one I've kind of heard uh, as far as that. But it was quite, yeah. it was quite an interesting story, though. Was. Yeah, and I think, uh, and I think we've already covered this. At least from Lee Roscoe. Uh, does Chris know of any reports of UFO landings in Scotland? Uh, so well, apart from the one in the field, a lot of UFO-related stuff because it's your area, Chris, aren't we? But uh, can you add anything to that? Yeah, well, just obviously the, the, the landings and stuff where we have the, the one in uh, has been recounted before the Bob Taylor sighting, which is yeah. over in uh, Beckman. You've got obviously the one with the, the triangle one as well. Um, aye, but that, as far as I know, that's the kind of main ones in this area. Uh, landings and stuff. Uh, well, I've, I've loved listening to what you've got to tell us tonight, especially that thing we described as shaped like a Toblerone. 
Oh, that's, that's uh, me riveted and the silver man. I mean, even, there's a book title there. Do you know what I mean? You want to be writing about that? It's brilliant. Uh, it's it really, really good. But uh, do you want to fit out else in for a few minutes? Or well, mainly that. I mean, in terms of um, for what I can he want you can look at next and stuff. I mean, there's, there's all these stories. More, there's, there's more. There's more coming through, and there's more to edit and stuff. But there's one of the areas where I do want to look at. We talked about the cryptids earlier on. Is um, you've got Ben McDo yeah. um, up in Scotland, so you've got the the Grey Man phenomena and stuff like that. I had never looked into that before because I was it wasn't in my bag and looking at any baby cryptids and stuff until um, over the last couple of years. And then we're looking at that up there for the amount of different reports up there. You you think there is reports on about it, which I've seen the kind of recent ones. But when you look back and the reports gone back when the the book the Big Grey Man of Ben McDo was written. The reports that um, Affleck Gray puts in his book were only the only ones that he can kind of deemed worth kind of right enough to put in the book. Where it was like prominent mountaineers and stuff like that, and they've seen something. They've definitely yeah. seen something. There's although there's a lot of things we're saying it's the spectre of the broken, which was a a light phenomenon that people maybe see with the shadow and the clouds and stuff. That was one of the explanations. But when you look at the area, there's a lot of different things up there. We've got there's loads of accounts. There's stuff he didn't put in the book. They had a dossier, a lot of different stuff, and he was fed that by somebody else. The, the, the area as well has got um, different things where you've got the Grey Man sightings, right, which throughout the years, you've got strange things where you're getting um, people hearing music and voices and stuff. You're getting um, things like um, kind of ghostly apparition kind of things as well. It's a high level of quartz area as well. Yeah. It's geomagnetic anomaly. And well, one of the mountains across the is called um, the Devil's Point. It used to be called the Celts of Devil's Penis, right? For some reason, it's called that. So there's a lot of kind of strange stuff up there going as well. I want to kind of look into that a wee bit more as well. If you ever look into it and, want to, and decide you're going to do some boats on the ground, yeah, I know time's tight for you, contact me, because the Grey Man is something I'm really interested in. I, yeah, think about, I think we're going to have to kind of wind up now, Chris, and it's honestly really enjoyed speaking to you. Yes, uh, yeah, and we know where we've got all your contact details. The listeners know where to get you. Scottish Paranormal Podcast, and I'm going to hand it over to Les now to uh, just say goodbye to everybody. And in the chat, thank you, guys. Most appreciated. Cheers, guys. Yeah, I've got to say, and I've got to put the call out on, I'm sure Paul uh, will concur with me. If uh, we asked you to come on again at some future point, because I know you've been a great guest tonight, Chris, and uh, because obviously you've got lots of other accounts that you could uh, recall on, on, on the show. Yeah. Would you do Would you do that? Yeah, definitely come back anything, definitely. Yeah, we'll put you on the spot now, haven't you? Haven't we? <laughs> yeah, we'll put you on the spot. Uh, right, so it remains for me then, uh, as host of the show, uh, or co-host, uh, for me to wrap it up and say thanks to you two guys. Thanks, uh, Chris Meek, for coming on, and thanks to Paul Sinclair. Okay. And there we go, guys. Now, I think you'll agree with me, that was uh, a pretty fascinating show uh, with uh, lots of accounts coming from uh, north of the border. And um, I'm sure Chris will come on again uh, at some future point to give us some more uh, of his uh, research accounts. In the meantime, you can uh, contact Chris on uh, some of the links in the show notes. And obviously, yeah, the show notes uh, contain links for Paul's website, etc., etc. So I've got to thank Deborah Singleton for moderating tonight. Uh, fantastic uh, job, uh, Debbie. I've got to thank. Uh, that's who we've got to thank. We've got to thank everybody who's coming to the chat. Uh, some great questions tonight, as always. Um, we will be back on the, next week. Uh, got a great guest on. You'll you'll see the banner come out later on in the week. And uh, I'm sure that will be equally as good. So it just remains for me, Les, to say good night and see you all next time.